Yeah, I guess I'm at the age where a couple weeks ago or a month ago, I was in the attic at, at Abundant Life and hit my head in one of the trusses and uh, ended up tearing my retina. Ended up going to the doctor and having to get surgery for that. It's good to be here today. If you were here last week, you got to meet the younger, better looking Beachy. Today you get the older, and I was going to say wiser, but I, I realize that's probably not true. At least the older Beachy. And it, it's good to be here. I know a lot of you, and uh, I want to thank you. I know a lot of you have prayed for my, my family over the last month. Uh, tomorrow will be a month that my mom passed away. And Friday night and yesterday all day, we were at my mom's house going through stuff. And we didn't realize how much stuff there was. And it gave me a real desire to start going through my stuff. Because I don't want my kids, not that she, she wasn't a pack rat by any means, but there's just a lot of things to do and it brought back a lot of memories. But it's good to be here. See, uh, J.R. and Rhonda Yoder here today. And thanks to them, since 2003, my wife and I have never had a fight or an argument. We went through a a Bible study with them, and we have not honestly had an argument or fight since then. Now, we've had times of intense fellowship, (laughs) because we found out that's what it's called. And a couple of weeks ago, we had a time of intense fellowship. It wasn't really that intense. Um, I pulled into the Coles parking lot, and I parked in this space. I have a picture of the space I parked in. Could Could you put that? Yeah. Senior citizens parking only. And my wife said, what are you doing? I said, well, that's 55 and older, right? I'm 56, so I qualify. And I parked there, and she said, I am not getting out of the car in this space. (laughs) She said, you either have to move or I'm staying in the car. So I moved to another spot. I took that picture, put it on Facebook, and there was a lot of disagreement over that. I asked, do I qualify to be in this space? The best response I got was from my cousin in Ohio who said, yes, you qualify, but you're able to walk around really well, so don't take advantage of that space. Use that, leave that for someone who can't get around as well as you. So I said, okay, I won't park in there again. But to prove to you this morning that I qualify to sit in that, or park in that space, I'm going to say something that we've all heard. And when we were little growing up and we heard it, we went, oh no, here we go again. But I'm old enough now to say this. When I was a kid, you heard those, right? When I was a kid, it was a lot tougher than it is for kids today. I walked to school five miles both ways uphill in the snow. Well, actually, in Hartville, I rode the bus. When we moved here, I did walk half a mile to get the bus to go to Riverview, but it wasn't in the snow, and if you know Sarasota, it wasn't uphill. Uh, When I was a kid, I didn't have all the toys kids have today. I had two sticks that I banged together, and I was happy to have those. Well, actually, as a kid in Hartville, my dad got me a go-kart, which was later replaced by a mini bike. When I was a kid, I learned to work hard on the farm from sunup to sundown every day. Actually, no, that's not the case. My dad had a gas station, and I, quote, worked at my dad's gas station. When I was a kid, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 40 years old. But then again, cell phones really weren't well available until I was 34. So, how about this? When I was a kid in school, you marked boy or girl, and that was it. When I was a kid in school, abortion was illegal, and my heart broke a few weeks ago when the state of New York passed an abortion law, and after it was passed and signed into the law, the people stood and applauded, and applauded. When I was a kid, I remember praying in school. Uniontown Elementary and Lake Middle School. When I was a kid, we had Christmas vacation and Easter vacation, not winter and spring break. 
When I was a kid, the R-rated movie that was shown would be the G-rated movie of today. When I was a kid, people seemed to be a little bit more civil towards each other. Now, I understand there were problems when I was a kid. I was four years old and not yet in school when the schools were integrated. So during the early part of my lifetime, we had segregation in our country, which I cannot believe. During my lifetime, we had the Vietnam War. During my lifetime, drugs became a problem. During my lifetime, the sexual revolution began. When I was a little kid in elementary school, we would have drills where we would hide under our desks or in our lockers because of the Soviet Union. There were problems when I was growing up, when I was a kid. But as I look around, sometimes I, I think I can't even recognize the country I live in because things have changed so much. And if we're honest, there's tolerance for everyone and everything except Christians and Christianity. Sin and abnormal, abnormal behavior are celebrated. The only moral absolute in our country today is the fact that there are no moral absolutes. You know, I used to like to listen to, it, it's called contemporary Christian today, music. But when I was a kid, we listened to Christian rock and roll. Anybody remember Christian rock and roll? Yeah. Anybody remember a guy named Randy Stonehill? He, he had a song in the late 70s. It's called Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. Anybody remember that song? Nobody wants to admit they're as old as I am. Okay. I want to read you part of that song. It says, well, it's okay to murder babies, but we really ought to save the whales. We're putting criminals in office because it's way too crowded in the jails. TV, and we could replace that with internet. TV is our teacher now. The schools are overrun by thugs. And children skip their innocence and graduate to sex and drugs. Right is wrong, and wrong is right. White is black, and black is white. I think I just lost my appetite. Stop the world, I want to get off. Stop the world, I want to get off. This is too weird for me. Stop the world, I want to get off. I get the definite impression that this isn't how it's meant to be. That song was written in the late 70s. And I think we can say it's still valid today. You know, last week, a couple weeks ago when Andy asked me to speak, I knew right away what God wanted me to share. Last Monday morning, I was up early. I was reading my Bible reading plan that I've used the same one for the last 14 years. So every day of the year, I read the same thing the next year. And that morning, I read something in Psalm chapter 12 that I think applies to our world today. And God said, this is what I want you to speak about. And I said, but Lord, I got the message already ready. And he said, this is what I want you to speak about. So I want you to listen to... I'm going to read the first and last verse of that psalm. It's only eight verses long. But the first verse says, Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Stop right there for a second. Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like in our culture, you look around and you go, Wow, God, where's, where are the godly people at? We're way outnumbered. Where are the, are the faithful people? And how many of us know people that at one time were godly? People at one time who were faithful. And we look around today and they're not here. They vanished. They are no more. Because they found it was a lot easier to walk the other way than to be godly and faithful. And you know, it's easy 
to say, man, you know, to rail against society, to rail against culture, to talk about how bad things are. But like I said, this song was written in the late 70s. And all you got to do is go back a little bit farther. And they were saying the same thing. They're always saying, this is the end, look how bad it is. And it seems like it continues to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And as I was reading that verse, I actually journaled on that verse today, uh, in that day in my, in my Bible reading plan. But what God really spoke to me about was the last verse. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. And I thought about that. Oh, man, how we, how we honor what's vile today. But God said, don't stop there. Go back to the first verse. And that's what the problem is. The problem isn't the wickedness that is honored. The problem is the godly are no more. The problem is the faithful have vanished. God's not looking down saying the sin is the problem. God's looking down, I believe, at us as a church and saying, you're the problem. Where yet? Why aren't you standing up? Now, I'm not talking about getting in people's faces and yelling and protesting. When we lived in El Paso, our daughter Hannah had a number of open heart surgeries, three before she was two years old. Almost every week she was at a doctor. And we went to a clinic. It was called the uh, Border Children's Clinic. And so every week I drove to the Border Children's Clinic almost, almost every week with her. Right near the Border Children's Clinic was an abortion clinic. And every day that I passed that abortion clinic, there was somebody across the street with a van that had posters all on the side of the van that said doctor, whatever his name was, we'll call him Dr. Smith, is a murderer and had pictures of babies that had been aborted. And I'm against abortion as much as anybody, but I don't think that's the way we go about it. We don't condemn people for what they do naturally. We bring them the good news. And that's what I want to talk about last, last week. I'm so excited that, that my son was able to be here with Ryan and Andy and I think Dave. And you all had a discussion about what it means to share the good news. Well, I want to take that and, and, and build off of it today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Matthew. Because if we're honest, the godly have vanished. There's a lot of strutting going around today, aren't, isn't there? You know, when I, when I um, can you go back to that verse before? I'm sorry. It says, the, the, the wicked freely strut. I don't know what you think of when you think of the word strut. I think of peacocks. Think of roosters. But the Bible says it's sinful people. I had a, I had a rooster growing up. And I just love to watch, you know, chickens. They, they do that when they walk, you know. And the Bible says that's what sinful people do. They're just like, yeah. Look at me. Look at my sin. They're proud of it. You know, everywhere you look, people are outraged too. Liberals and conservatives. Democrats and Republicans. Independents and Libertarians. It doesn't matter. Why? Because they don't have the answer. The answer to our dilemma is not found in the political party. Vote for whoever you want, but trust Jesus. And I want to see today now, what does Jesus say about this dilemma? How can we as a church do anything about this? So now if we go to Matthew, I want to read, this is probably the most famous sermon that was ever, ever shared, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. I want to read three different passages in Matthew. And I, I believe I didn't give the last one to you, but it's just a couple of verses. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before them before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
I want us to, to realize today that according to Jesus, I believe we've lost our taste and we've lost our light. I'm not going to say salt because Jesus uses the word salt, but he also talks about taste. And so I want to talk about taste and light. First of all, taste. You know, Jesus, I believe, was the tastiest person who ever lived. And what I mean by that is, Jesus put a good taste in people's mouth. People were naturally drawn to him. But how do people feel about Rick Beachy? How do people feel about Bayshore Church? You know, a non-believer one time was asked, well, with all your problems, why don't you consider going to church? And they responded with, going to church? I already feel bad enough about myself. Why would I go to church and feel even worse? And if we're honest, Jesus said, we're the salt of the earth. We're the taste of the earth. But we've given people a reason to have a bad taste in their mouth because of church. Why? Because people have had bad experiences in church. People have felt condemned in church. And I don't know, I might have used this example when I was here once before, but I know a guy who went to a service one evening. And he knew the usher, and he didn't go to church very often, but he really felt like he wanted to get back with the Lord. And he went to church one evening, and when the usher greeted him, he said, Speak of the devil. You can imagine how many times that guy went back to that church. You know, Jesus was the only person who was ever perfect. And, and we sometimes think, well, if, if I hang around people that aren't Christians, I, I might get contaminated. But Jesus was the only person ever who was perfect. And he wasn't afraid to hang around people like that. We've got to be the taste that draws people to Jesus. You know, one time, uh, I was probably like 13 years old, and it was a Saturday afternoon, and I was going to watch a baseball game at home. I can still remember it. I poured a big bowl of cornflakes because my mom, you know, who just passed away, did not buy coated cereal, you know, sugar cereal. It's not good for you, she'd say. So I bought poured this big bowl of cornflakes and probably put about eight or ten scoops of sugar on it, you know. <laughs> Sat down, had the game on, stirred it all up, took a bite, and at that moment realized I had confused the salt container for the sugar container. It went in as, it came out as fast as it went in, put it that way. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But sometimes in our saltiness, we repel people. There are times to be salty and there are times to be sweet. And we as a church have to know the difference. Because instead of saying, oh my goodness, where, look at all the vile things that are going on. Why not ask, why aren't we drawing more people to, to Jesus? They can get out of those vile things. You know, I, I uh, stopped at Checkers one time. I don't eat much at Checkers anymore because I got sick one time really bad, and I decided that's not a good place to go. But I still buy ice cream and milkshake at Checkers because that's not as bad as the other stuff, so you know. Went through the drive through at Checkers and ordered a large strawberry shake. Paid for it, put the straw in, started to drive, and I took a drink, and I went, hmm, that's unique. Doesn't taste like the strawberry I've usually had. Didn't think anything about it. I took a couple more, you know, uh, drinks through the straw. Man, this is, it's okay, but it's just not like regular strawberry. I finally, about a half mile down the road, a mile down the road, I pulled up, I pulled it to a red light and took the lid off and looked down and realized I was drinking a chocolate milkshake. It was chocolate, but in my mind it was Strawberry. And so my mind was trying to convince my taste buds that it was strawberry. And I remember as I was preparing for this, God brought that back to my mind. And he said, that's what sometimes we do as a church, or you do as a church. In your mind, you're thinking, 
we're pretty welcoming. We're pretty friendly. We share the gospel. But what do other people taste? You know, it's one thing to think that inside the group. It's another to to wonder, what does somebody who's outside the group think? You know, my mom um, didn't grow up in a Christian home. Didn't grow up in a Mennonite or Amish family. Her last name was Griffin. And they were hillbillies from West Virginia, which in Ohio was bad enough. But I think for a long time, my mom didn't feel like she was a part. Because she heard over and over again, oh, you're not Mennonite. Or or I heard, oh, your mom didn't grow up Mennonite, did she? Oh, your mom was from West Virginia. And we don't realize how people feel. I know I had a pastor in Albuquerque who told me that I'm much more accepted with the name Rick Beachy than I would have been the other way around and having a name Rick Griffin. It shouldn't be like that in the church. We're the salt. We're the taste that people taste about Jesus. And when they taste us, are they repulsed or are they attracted? Jesus said the second thing you are there is you're the light of the world. If we're honest, our light's grown dim, and it's not Jesus that's grown dim, it's, it's our light. You know, I got a, I got a new phone. I went into to Verizon, and I said, I don't, I don't need the latest, say, you know, I had a, uh, a Samsung Galaxy. I said, I don't need the 9X or 9S or whatever. I said, you have like a 6? And uh, he said, I don't think we got one of those. He said, what do you have? And I showed him my phone, and it was a Galaxy 4. He said, oh, it doesn't matter what we have. It's going to be better than that. So I got a Galaxy 7J, I think is what it's called. Okay, my last phone, I had to put an app on for a flashlight. This one comes with one built in. It is so cool. So I'm going to see if I can do this because I'm still getting used to the phone. There we go. Yes. Flashlight. Yeah, that is so cool. And you know, it's bright. But actually today it's not really that bright right now, is it? Because it's in with a bunch of other light. It can't compete with those lights back there. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Where does light function best? Or where is light most productive? With other light? Isn't light most effective in the darkness? You know, um, I actually deleted the, the flashlight app from my other phone because it drained too much of my battery. And also, too, because one time I opened it up and it told me that it wanted to know about my pictures, my contacts, my calendar, and I'm like, you're a flashlight. <laughs> Why do you need to know all this stuff? So I deleted it. And there were times I'd walk through the, I've walked through the sanctuary of abundant life and the lights are all off. But you know what I found out? I could just turn the face of my phone on. And I could see the go. How many of you have done that? Yeah, you're like you're in a restaurant. And you get to that senior citizen parking time. And they bring you the menu and you're like, would you please turn the lights on? I can't see anything. So you take your phone and you go, oh, okay. Oh, I thought we were at Applebee's. We're at Chili's. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you can't see anything. You know, I love to be with light. But if I'm the light, and again, let me let me let me clarify. We're the light of the world in the same way that the moon is the light of the night. We know the moon in itself has no light. The moon only reflects the sun. And in ourselves, we have no light. We're the light of the world as the moon is the light of the night. We're only reflecting Jesus. And if Jesus has called us to be the light of the world, where am I going to be most effective? Trying to connect with people that are in the dark. Because a lot of those people that do the vile things, they don't want to be doing the vile things. But they feel trapped in what they're doing. 
and we come along and our light might not be that bright. But if it's really dark and we just have a little bit of light, we can show them which way to go. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Dale Tackett, who does the Truth Project, said, you know, the problem isn't the darkness. You know, he said that uh, when he moved into a new house, he went to the closet and opened the closet and was amazed that the closet all of a sudden got, became lit. So he went in the closet and closed the door and it was dark. But when he opened the closet door, the light came in. And he said, I, I wondered to him, he said he wondered to himself, why when I opened the closet, didn't the darkness spread out and overtake the light? Because the darkness doesn't overtake the light. The reason the darkness spreads is because the light dims. He said the problem isn't that somebody went out into the middle of Kansas and opened up a box of, box of darkness and the darkness has spread over our land. The problem is verse 1 in that Psalm 12, the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished. We've turned our lights off, put them in our pockets, and said, I'm going to go home. We're the light of the world. You know, it's, again, it's not like, you know, if you grew up watching cop shows. Remember the bad cop, bad cop, or good cop, bad cop, not bad cop, bad cop. The good cop, bad cop, where the guy would come in and the good cop would try to be nice and everything. And then the bad cop would take the light and shine it right in his eyes and try to blind him. No, it's not like that. You know, I told you I hit my head in the attic at church and hurt my eye and went into the eye doctor. And the eye doctor said, we need to send you to a specialist. So I went right across the parking lot to the retina specialist. And they did these tests. And they said, yeah, your retina is torn. And it must have just happened because it's bleeding. And the guy said, we can fix it right here today. And I was like, okay. So they took me back in this room, and they did a laser treatment on my eye. And he said, now it's going to hurt a little, understatement. So it's going to feel like somebody's pressing against your eye. Now it's more like an elephant is sitting on your eye. <laughs> he said, now if it gets too much, just tell me, and I'll stop and take a break. So all, he says, you got to open your So my eyes, you know, and this light is there, and it's like, wow, I mean, it is the brightest light. I, you know, I can't believe it. And it, it's feeling like there's all this pressure in my eye, and it just keeps going and going and going and going. And finally he stopped, and I said, oh, he's taking a break, and here he was done. I was like, praise God. But that light was so bright for the rest of the day, and he had already dilated my eye. For the rest of the day, I'm walking around, all I can see is a spot in front of my eye. You know, but that light was healing. I don't know how it worked. I don't know how he shines a laser light in my eye and like seals off the tear, but it happened. And my eye is fine. Light brings healing. Jesus said, you're the salt, you're the taste, and you're the light. The reason the vileness is uplifted is because the people are in darkness. We don't rail against the people in New York City who pass that abortion law. We pray for them because they are blinded. They're in the darkness. We say, Lord, make me a light in the darkness. The second thing I want to read down now in the next passage there in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. And Andy you guys don't have a clock anywhere, so I have no idea how long I've been preaching. So is there going to be like a 40-second countdown like in football or something? Or, Okay, you'll tell me? Okay. Matthew chapter 7, it says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does, not, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. A little over a week ago we were looking at a house, looking at a, a little house of some, that someone owned and 
in the garage, it had the most unique window I'd ever seen. This window went like this through the block. You could see right there's about a crack, about a half inch. You could see right outside. It wasn't a window, it was a crack in the, a crack in the wall. Because you went outside and you looked and the foundation had sunk. You looked up at the ceiling and the drywall had separated. You know, the foundation had an issue. Jesus said, if we do what he says, we're on a firm foundation. You know, that house needs repair to the foundation. You can't just take mortar and fill in the cracks and think it's going to be okay. Because eventually they're going to show again. Some settling has occurred. And I think, if I'm honest, the older I get, the easier it is to let settling happen when it comes to the Word of God. And I don't maybe take it as seriously as I once did. And I can be okay with that if I'm not careful. You know, we've lost, I think, as a church, our belief in the fact that this is God's Word. A couple of weeks ago, I saw an email. It said something about, oh, watch Bill Maher interact. If you know Bill Maher, he's an atheist who hates Christians, makes fun, loves to make fun of Christians. Watch him interact with an intellectual Christian and get, you know, knocked down. And so I thought, oh, that'll be interesting. So I turned on or went to the link or whatever and watched Bill Maher interact with this intellectual Christian. And it was interesting. You know, Bill Maher told the guy, I really like you. And the reason he really liked him is because he told Bill Maher, well, we have to understand, you know, that the book of Genesis is not a history book. God didn't actually create the world like that. We obviously know that it took billions of years through evolution. And so Christians that are honest know that the, that the Bible is just a story in that form. And he asked him, you know, the flood of Noah. Well, of course the flood of Noah is just a story. It's not real. I'm sure he would have said the same thing about the book of Jonah. All of a sudden I realized why Bill Maher liked this intellectual Christian is because this intellectual Christian had said, we can't trust this. We can't trust it for what it says. I had a friend that went to a Christian college. And he took an overview in Old Testament studies, and he learned there that the book of Genesis was not history, that Jonah was not history. And someone asked, well, Jesus mentioned Jonah, and the professor said, well, in the time of Jesus, they thought it was true too. So Jesus obviously thought it was true too. And we wonder why the walls are cracking. And I believe that goes back also to the taste and the light. If we don't have confidence that this is God's word, we're not going to stand. And we're not going to be salt and light. You know, we, we go to God's word like a buffet. Or like I like to call them a stuffet. Anybody remember Duff's? Yeah, if you laugh, you know, you remember Duff's. Here at not too far from here at Beniva and Fruitville. That revolving, you could just stand there. <laughs> you didn't have to find a table. Just stand there with your plate. I'll take some of this and just eat it, and then it'll come back again, you know, and you can just, yeah. That's what we've done with God's Word, haven't we? I'll take that. Ooh, I don't like that. Ooh, yeah, give me a, give me a double portion of that. No, 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 I'll stay away from that. You know, I, I want to commend you as a church. I know a, a, a while ago you made a decision to, to separate from a group. and I'm not here to downplay a group or anything. I grew up in the Hartville Mennonite Church. And I've got a lot of friends and family that still go there. And, and they made a decision to, to separate and join a group. And they're, they're not called that anymore. They're called Evermore. Why? And I'm not sure what all the reasons were, but I believe part of it was the fact that I want to stand on this. And I can't associate with a group that continually puts it down. 
You know, when we do that, we might get some flack. I know in the Hartville Mennonite Church or Evermore Church, I know people that left because they didn't want to be a part of that. Well, that might be the case. But if we're going to be salt and we're going to be light, we need to have a foundation. And this is the only foundation we've got. The last thing I want to say, I said we've lost our salt, our taste and our light. We've lost our foundation. Now, number three is I want to say that we need to lose something. And I don't know, I might not have sent these notes over, and if I didn't, I'm sorry. We need to lose our pride. And I'd like to read the last couple verses from Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said it, it says this, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. We need to be astonished, amazed, overwhelmed, blown away with Jesus and not ourselves. A couple of weeks ago, I went into the Dollar Tree, which is like my favorite store. I love it when I'm standing behind somebody in line at the Dollar Tree and they say, how much is this? Really? It's either a dollar or two for a dollar, you know, with the card, you know, but... Uh, I walk in and they had a table there with DVDs. Man, DVDs for a dollar, that's like shark to blood, you know. Whoa, what do they got here? You know, And I found one called Ragamuffin. Story of Rich Mullins, who was a Christian songwriter, died in an accident. I didn't know Rich Mullins' story. Rich Mullins struggled with alcohol all his life. Rich Mullins struggled with the fact, am I good enough for God? Then Rich Mullins met a guy named Brennan Manning, who had written the book, The Ragamuffin Gospel. And what Brennan Manning told Rich Mullins is, we're all ragamuffins. None of us can do it on our own. We all need God's grace and help. And I know when I start to think I can do it, that's when I'm going to fall. You know, I, I can't live the Christian life on my own. You can't live the Christian life on your own. You can't be the taste and the light of the world. I can't be the taste and the light of the world. I can't have a firm foundation. You can't have a firm foundation without God's grace and God's help. You know, today it's common for people to say, the church is the hope of the world. I disagree. Jesus is the hope of the world, and he happens to work through the church. Because the church in and of itself is not going to offer anybody hope unless they realize they can't do it. And it's got to come through Jesus. You know, that song I, I quoted earlier, Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. No, no, no. It's not Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. It's Stop, Rick, and Engage with the World. Last week, you talked about sharing the gospel. Sharing the gospel through, I, th I think you talked about this, didn't you, Ryan? Sharing the gospel through a very simple method. Very simple. And Andy, I don't know, that, that was a God thing because I have in here engage. Engage. We need to engage with the world if we ever want to see the world change. Let's not be the people who in Psalm 12 say, what's going on here? Look at how bad it is. Let's be the people who say, wow, it is bad. It's time for us to up our game. It's time for us to be the taste that people need. It's time for us to be the, the light that shows the way in the darkness. It's time for us to get back to this Bible and say, this is going to be my foundation come whatever comes. It's time for us to say, God, 
I can't do it on my own. I need your help. You know, I'm, when my dad was 56, he was an old man. At least I thought he was. And I'm sure there are a lot of people here today that think I'm an old guy, and I am. But I thought when I got to this age, I'd have it all together. And every time I think I have it all together, I forget where I put it. God's called us to be the taste, the light, based on our foundation in Christ. And to say, God, we can't do it. It takes you. So I want to encourage you today. God's called you to engage where you're at. God's called you to be the taste and the light and offer people a foundation through Christ. I want to invite, I wrote it down because the last time I was here, I invited Josiah to come up with the worship band. Um, Zachariah is going to come up. And as, he, as they're coming, I just, I just want to pray for you as they're coming to get ready. And thank you for giving me the privilege of coming with my family today. And, uh, and I'm, I'm planning to be here Saturday. I'm excited about what God's going to do. As we engage and take the taste and take the light and take the foundation that we have in Christ. Father, I thank you for the church here at Bayshore. God, I thank you for every person that's here. And Father, I thank you that because of Jesus, we can be who you've called us to be. Father, help us to realize that it's not on our own, but it's only through Jesus. And I pray that you would use this congregation, that you would use each person in this congregation to engage those around them. And I thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen.